understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Well, before we get started, we need to make sure that we're in fellowship, ready to study the word. And I appreciate everybody's prayers, and we'll see how far I go before I start hacking and coughing. And since Connie wasn't here tonight, I don't have any water up here. So, Doug, if you'll take care of that, I appreciate it. <coughs> see, I know it wouldn't be long. So, <coughs> while uh, he's doing that, let's bow our heads together, and we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, again, we're so grateful that we can come together and have fellowship around the teaching of your word, that we can be strengthened, encouraged, edified in our souls by the uh, truth of your word as we come to understand it, understand the scope of your plan and your purposes, that we can better understand where we as believer priests in the church age fit within the uh, dispensational structure of history, how to understand these things and Father, we pray that you'd give us clarity of thought and concentration this evening and that as we study these things, we would be just encouraged with the truthfulness of your word and the faithfulness of your character. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we've been going through Hebrews 7, yeah, 7, and taking a little detour in terms of understanding the change that's taking place. And change indicates that there are some things that are different Some things may stay the same, but some things are different, and that is really a hallmark, we might say, of what is known as dispensationalism. And so I've taken the last few lessons to go over dispensationalism and where dispensationalism comes from out of the Bible, what it means, basic ideas related to it. And in the last lesson, which was a couple of weeks ago, I looked at various things related to covenant theology to begin with, and then at the end of the lesson, if memory serves me correctly, I was beginning to get into issues related to hermeneutics or interpretation, which is so important today. And many of you may not realize, but we live in a world today where it's very different from 30, 40, or 50 years ago. 30, 40, 50 years ago, there was a strong... Uh, movement uh, among dispensationalists. It was a dominant uh, or dominating position, in, in especially in popular uh, theology among churches. I think in a lot of ways it still is, but there's just so much going on today in the study of prophecy that wasn't even around uh, whenever it was, 25, 27 years ago when I graduated from Dallas Seminary. We hardly gave five minutes notice to post-millennialism when I went through seminary. It was considered a dead theology that nobody was post-millennial anymore, nobody spent any time, and in going through four years of Dallas Seminary, I don't think I once heard the word preterist, which refers to a, a uh, what is becoming more and more visible uh, view of prophecy today that most of Matthew 24 and Revelation were not fulfilled, excuse me, were fulfilled before 70 AD in the judgment on Israel that these are all based on allegorical and symbolic interpretations and that there's very little of biblical prophecy left to be fulfilled. And if you don't listen to a lot of Christian radio or you don't listen to the Bible Answer Man on the radio or some of the other shows that are out there, then you may be completely oblivious to this. But it's important to kind of understand where we are today and and what's going on. I think that in the last, I guess it's been 10 years or so since the first Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins book, Left Behind, Volume 1, 
came out that, that again, really appealed to people in the pew, and it's had a tremendous uh, impact on a lot of people, but yet it's also, just as its uh, predecessor, late great planet Earth, uh, did in the 70s, has come under a tremendous amount of attack, uh, attack from people who don't believe in a dispensational framework for understanding the scriptures. And today, it's, you know, Tommy Ice and I joke about these guys that that uh, get up there and their basic testimony is sort of like, well, I was a teenage dispensationalist, with the implication, of course, being that now that I've studied the Bible a little bit and grown up and matured, I no longer follow that sort of juvenile approach to Scripture. And so there's a, a lot of that uh, going on. This is why uh, back, oh, it's been almost 20 years ago, Tommy and I used to sit around in my living room in, in Irving and t think about, wouldn't it be great if we could establish some kind of dispensational think tank where uh, scholars around the country who are still held to traditional dispensationalism could come together and uh, study, present papers, meet on a regular basis. And, and <clears throat> at the time, I wasn't able to get involved with the inception, but Tim LaHaye came along and got in touch with Tommy, and he had was in a position where he could help fund the pre-trib rapture study group and get that going. And at that time, Tommy was pastoring a church in Oak Hill in uh, Austin, Oak Hill Bible Church, and he left that to go full-time uh, to develop the pre-trib uh, study group and that's what that has become is a real think tank for dispensationalists and out of that have come a number of different books that were published in the 90s and and up to the present time in fact I just got a uh, electronic copy of a book that uh, is going to the publisher it's supposed to come out at the uh, by early December an answer to a recent book that Hank Hanegraaff wrote uh, attacking dispensationalism and the pre-trib rapture and everything else and espousing um, the whole preterist position. So, you know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, and, and if you're not aware of it, that sort of gives you a little bit of an idea that there are people who really wrestle with these things, and I get questions from people about it now and then. People email me or uh, send it in to the staff at Dean Bible and I end up getting it and having to answer those questions. But people wonder because they're not taught these things. And then if they come out of certain backgrounds, if you come out of a charismatic or Pentecostal background, for example, then you have another problem because in the Pentecostal tradition, there was a lot of dispensational teaching. And at the begin, when some of you may not know, but the Pentecostal movement didn't begin until January 1st, 1901, so it's a relatively new movement. And uh, in the early years, they were influenced to some degree by the Schofield Reference Bible, as were many uh, conservatives and many evangelicals. But they were also influenced by other things, and so you get a lot of a lot of the popular charismatics that you see on TV, from Pat Robertson to others, have elements, sort of a mishmash, sort of a, a real hodgepodge theology, where they may be premillennial and they may have some elements of, of something positive towards Israel, then other times they don't. They're just not consistent on the rapture, and they pick up sort of pick and choose terminology from other systems of theology, and so it just gets all kind of put in their, the blender of their theology, and you get something that's, uh, that's totally different. So I want to just go over some terminology that we've been using just to make sure you understand it. Covenant theology is a system of theology that really comes out of the Reformed branch of the Protestant Reformation. When you think back to what happened after Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg in uh, October 31st, 19, or 19, uh, excuse me, 1517, not 1917, 1517, then subsequent to that you had the development of the Protestant Reformation. And traditionally when historians talk about the Protestant Reformation, they divide it into uh, basically uh, four branches. You have the uh, Lutheran branch, which is uh, comes out of Germany and influences the Scandinavian countries as well. Then you have the French aspect, French-Swiss aspect of the Protestant Reformation, influenced by people like uh, Henri Bullinger and Ulrich Zwingli and and uh, Calvin as well. And then you have the 
uh, English Reformation. And the English Reformation is heavily influenced by uh, Calvinism. And so you have the English part of the Reformation and the French-Swiss part of the Reformation generally comes under the umbrella of Reformed theology. If you didn't know what that means, that's where that, that comes from. And it produced... Uh, congregational churches and Presbyterian churches heavily influenced a lot of the theology in the uh, Anglican church at that time uh, was was heavily reformed in its theology. And so covenant theology comes out of that flow. And then the fourth branch, I said there were four branches of the Reformation. You had Lutheranism, French Swiss Reformation, British, British uh, Reformation, and the Anabaptist school, and the term Anabaptist means second baptism. That prefix A-N-A indicates a second baptism because most of those people at the beginning had been baptized in the state church as infants, and they came to convictions that a that baptism was really for someone who was a professing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, not for infants, but for adults who had uh, trusted Christ, and there were two things that made a Baptist a Baptist. I, you know, and all the, a lot of the people I know don't know this, and I'm talking about pastors, Baptist. I used to stump Baptist pastors and say, "What makes a Baptist a Baptist?" And they'd give me all kinds of answers about doctrine, or about, uh, you know, they they believe in uh, uh, this thing or that thing. Most people don't know. I had one uh, friend that is an unbelieving Jewish urologist here in Houston. And he was the only one who knew the answer to the question. And there are two things that make a Baptist a Baptist. The first is that they believe in baptism by immersion. As a, an adult, a, a, the post-conversion baptism by immersion. The second is separation of church and state. And that's it. Baptists are very proud, and they will say that they are a non-creedal people. And what that means, if you're not familiar with the terminology, is that they don't believe that there is a set doctrinal statement, i.e. a creed, that everybody has to believe, that all Baptists have to believe in. And so that's why you have, you'll talk about Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists, and you'll talk about Conservative Baptists, and all these are different denominations. But even within the Southern Baptist Convention over the last 30 years, if you've paid attention, there's been a huge battle between the conservatives and the moderates slash liberals. And this has affected all of their seminaries. Unfortunately, the conservatives have sort of won out. And part of the deal was, back in the 70s, many uh, Southern Baptist institutions, their, their mission organizations, their seminaries, were throwing out the whole doctrine of inspiration and inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture and buying into a liberal view of, uh, of the Bible. And there was a judge here in Houston, Paul Pressler, and there was... Uh, uh, one of uh, uh, W.A. Criswell's bulldogs up there in Dallas, uh, Paige Patterson, who's now the president of Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, uh, r- really took the bull by the horns and, and created a huge battle within the Southern Baptist Convention to regain control, which they did by the late by the late 90s. But part of the issue there was that the liberals were saying, we're not a creedal people. You can't make inerrancy and infallibility something we have to subscribe to in order to be a Baptist. But you only have to believe two things to be a Baptist, adult immersion and separation of church and state. You don't have to believe in Christ. You don't have to uh, believe in anything else, just those two things. So the Anabaptist movement uh, came out, was the fourth branch of the Protestant Reformation. So covenant theology developed about 100 years after the start of the Reformation, about 100 years after Calvin. <coughs> but it, when certain areas of understanding of covenant theology just continued the same kind of uh, understanding of prophecy and interpretation of Scripture that had dominated the, uh, the church, and I use that in a broad sense, had dominated Christendom, since the 5th or 6th century A.D., and that was a less than literal interpretation of Scripture to the extreme of allegorical interpretation. And once you get into that approach to uh, the interpretation of, of especially prophecy, the first thing that goes is a distinction between Israel and the church, and that is that they became part of a broader term that I use called replacement theology. 
and replacement theology is any theological system where that sees Israel as being replaced by the church because they reject Jesus as Messiah. The, it, God's promises to Israel end, all of his covenants to Israel end, the literal fulfillment. They're sort of cut off completely. God, as, and the analogy they'll use is God gives them a bill of divorce, and they're divorced, and he takes a second wife, as it were, the church. And so Israel is completely replaced by the church, and literal promises that were given to Abraham in the Old Testament, such as promise to a literal piece of real estate, that becomes allegorized or spiritualized to heaven. And so they would interpret Old Testament passages in non-literal ways. Now, replacement theology covered a wide range of theologies. Lutherans were still amillennial and replacement theology. All your Reformed branches, Dutch Reformed, with these still some state churches, Dutch Reformed, Swiss Reformed, your Huguenots, uh, most of them were all all into some form of replacement theology. Presbyterians, uh, your uh, many of your Puritans. Our Puritans became kind of a mixed bag. Some were Amil, but a lot of the Puritans that came to America were premillennial. And many of them had a view of a distinction between Israel and the church. They didn't go so far as to have a view of, uh, of dispensationalism, but they were premillennial. And that gets into a fuzzy area there. Sometimes you'll read the term historical premillennialists, and some historical premillennialists, they're not dispensational, but some were futurists, some were not. And I'm not going to get distracted by going through an analysis of that. But basically, all amillennial, postmillennial systems, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, uh, Re- Reformed, Wesleyan, slash Methodist, Anglican, all of these systems were replacement theology. The only system that is consistently non-replacement is dispensationalism, although you do have some non-dispensational pre-mills that uh, are... Uh, they aren't into replacement theology. They're, they hold various forms, and that's just due to people's uh, inconsistencies. So we talked about covenant theology the la- last time, that that is generally viewed as the polar opposite to dispensationalism. And even though that excludes some of these replacement theolog- theologies, that's it's primarily the uh, among evangelicals, it's either this covenant theology or, or dispensationalism. And as I pointed out last time, the covenants in covenant theology are not the biblical covenants that we think of when we talk about covenants. They are theologically inferred covenants, the covenant of works that God had with Adam until he sinned, and then the covenant of grace. There are also some who believe and hold to a covenant of redemption. And as I gave a quote last time, Louis Burkhoff, that the agreement between the, the, the covenant of redemption is the agreement between the Father and the Son, giving the Son the head and the Redeemer of the elect, and the Son voluntarily taking place of those whom the Father had, had given him. Now, not all covenant theologians hold to a covenant of redemption. I also pointed out various problems with covenant theology and the one that is that I'm most interested in in terms of where we're what I'm talking about tonight is in the area of of uh, interpretation because they spiritualize a great deal of of prophecy that that speaks about the restoration of Israel they constantly read the new testament back into the back into the old testament and what they end up saying basically is that you do, can't really determine what the meaning of the Old Testament was until you get the New Testament. And once you get the New Testament, then all of a sudden you can interpret these symbols and types, things of that nature, in the Old Testament. And it doesn't mean what it, uh, it, it <clears throat> seems to mean at the, um, when, in the original historical context in which these these things were given. This also affects their view of the church because the Israel in the Old Testament is the church in formation, and then uh, we the church today is they would call that spiritual Israel. And you you can see elements of that in the history, even of this country, where people uh, held still held to Sabbath observance. 
although I remember one Old Testament theologian used to teach up at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, you know, they, they moved Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and then he would observe the Sabbath by not watching football games. So it's not quite, quite the same, but that's part of the problem. Once you start allegorizing, you lose your anchor to any kind of objectivity, and things become relatively, relatively subjective. Well, I backed up a little bit and uh, thought I would just introduce a couple of new slides on <clears throat> the whole concept of interpretation and hermeneutic, hermeneutics. And the, here we go, good start. Okay, hermeneutics comes from the Greek verb hermeneuo. And this is derived from the Greek god Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods. It was his responsibility to communicate and to interpret the messages from the gods to whomever. And so that's where this verb has its, has its origin. It has the basic idea of bringing someone an understanding of something, helping them understand what something means, uh, explaining something, making it clear or intelligible, intelligible to uh, cipher, to interpret, to make uh, something clear. So that's the idea behind this word hermeneutics. It's the uh, science and art of interpretation. So that's what it is. It's both a science and an art. And Milton Terry, who uh, wrote a book a little over 100 years ago called Biblical Hermeneutics, uh, defines it this way. He said, hermeneutics, therefore, is both a science and an art. As a science, it enunciates principles, investigates the laws of thought and language, and uh, classifies its facts and results. A few typo typos in there. <laughs> classifies its facts and results. He was also a dietitian. Uh, classifies its facts and results. As an art, it teaches what application these principles should have and establishes their soundness by showing their practical value in the, elucida in the elucidation of the more difficult scriptures. The hermeneutical art thus cultivates and establishes a valid exegetical procedure. Okay, let me break that down for you. As a science, that means that there are clear objective principles that you use to, in order to understand and interpret any piece of literature, from the instructions to fill out your income tax, to poetry, to a novel, to anything at all, to the Constitution of the United States. How do you interpret it? How, do, how should a judge interpret the Constitution and interpret law? Does he make it mean something new, or does he understand it in terms of the limitations uh, set upon it by its historical contents, context and the original intent of the authors. So uh, hermeneutics covers a lot of areas, but we're just focusing on the area of its application in, uh, in Scripture. So it involves certain principles. It, it analyzes uh, thought, language, logic. All this is part of understanding uh, hermeneutics and then classifies these, these results as an art that's where the application comes in because as an interpreter, as a, as a pastor, as a student of Scripture, when you come to the text, you have to take these objective rules and laws of interpretation and then apply those to a particular passage. And depending upon your experience and your education, background, frame of reference, uh, years of study, all of these kinds of things, it depends on the soundness of your interpretation. So we talk about different kinds of principles that we'll go through, but this precedes exegesis. Hermeneutics doesn't come after you exegete a passage. These are the rules that you establish ahead of time that you bring to the process of, of exegesis. Okay. Last time I pointed out that the, the primary definition for literal interpretation is, is one of the best I've seen is put out by D.L. Cooper and um, he said that when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense make no other sense therefore take every word at its ordinary usual literal meaning 
unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths cl- indicates clearly otherwise. So that means that you start with a passage, reading it, thinking, okay, what did, what would, how would I understand this if this was written on a note from my next door neighbor to me? You know, how would I understand that in terms of the normal use of, of, of language, the figures of speech that are uh, idioms, the colloquial language? How would I understand this? So if it makes full sense just in terms of reading it at face value, then what he says is don't try to read something else into the text. Don't try to make it mean something that's that sounds more spiritual or sounds like it's... it's uh, you, sometimes... I remember years ago when I first started studying how to study the Bible, you'd hear people say, every passage talks about Christ. Well, how does it talk about Christ? Okay, not every passage, every passage in some sense points forward, but that can be a very loose sense. I mean, if you go through the the, uh, genealogies in Genesis 5 or Genesis 11, you might be reading those and going, well, how do I see Christ here? And see, if you d- dwell on that for a while, who knows what you'll hallucinate and what kind of hidden meanings you'll, you'll pull out of there. But if you understand it within the flow of biblical thought within Genesis, as we saw, that you start with the seed of the woman in Genesis 3, and then there is this uh, re- intense record keeping of who begets whom in Genesis 5, Genesis 11, and on through the Old Testament, and that's tracing the line of the seed. So in that sense, yes, indeed, it does eventually point to Christ, but you have to understand it literally and not try to read some hidden meanings, You know, try to read each name and uh, figure out, okay, what's the spiritual meaning here? How can I, how can I take the name of Methuselah and make that... Uh, applicable to the decision making in my life today, but that's what some people would do. So, if it makes common sense, make no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its ordinary, usual, literal meaning. And last, see, there's a caveat here, and we all do this every day in English. You hear somebody speak, you hear a newscaster, you hear people on a talk show. And you'll hear idioms, and you'll hear figures of speech, and your mind, because you know English, and that's your native language, and that's your 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 first language, you automatically sort those things out. You don't even think about it. You automatically know when someone is speaking literally, or they're speaking uh, hyperbolically. They're exaggerating. Uh, you can tell by the tone of their voice. You can you can tell if they're using. Uh, uh, you know colloquialisms or if they're using uh, idioms you can you figure that out but the difficulty when you come to scripture is we're separated by 2 to 4000 years in time plus we're sep- separated by a language barrier because uh you have uh languages that uh had nuances 2000 3000 years ago that, that we're not sure of today and so uh, we have to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about that. And one of the clues is going to, in Scripture is going to be the immediate context. So you automatically know that if you're looking at poetry, if, you're interp- if you, you have a Shakespearean sonnet in front of you, and you have a real estate contract in front of you, you automatically know that you're going to read them a little bit differently, that the language in a real estate contract is going to be defined within a very narrow legal framework, but the language of metaphor and simile that you have in poetry is going to be it's going to be broader. It's going to encompass a broader range of meaning, and you have to understand these these various comparisons. So you look at the context, and then you compare related passages. You look at how words are used, and, and a word may be used one way by Paul, and another way by John, and another way by Peter. And so you, you compare and contrast these things. You do word studies. You, and now with computers, see, the thing you can do is you can do phrase studies. Couldn't do phrase studies, you know, 15, 20 years and more ago. It would take you years to work out all the places where a particular phrase was used or just think it in terms of two or three words. For example, in um, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 13, these three abide, faith, hope, and love. 
Well, how many, think about what it would take to study how many times you have faith, hope, and love appear within 10 words of each other in the New Testament. Well, that, you know, if all you're armed with is a concordance and you have to do it manually, that may take you several days to work that out. And um, those are the kinds of things that people used to write doctoral dissertations on. And you can just think when you didn't even have a concordance and it was 500 years ago and you had to read through the Greek text in order to find all those places that it might take years to do that. Now you can do it in 30 seconds. So, and, and the things that you derive from that is that sometimes phrases and clauses and certain idiomatic phrases like kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven can have a meaning that goes beyond the sum of the parts. So if you just do a word study on kingdom, you're not going to get the same impact as you would if you do a phrase search on kingdom of, uh, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. So you have to take the context into account and compare it with other passages in their uh, context. So that's, that's the basic understanding of what we mean by a literal uh, interpretation of Scripture. I gave you this quote last time from uh, Lang in his commentary on Revelation that the literalist is not one who denies that figurative language or symbols are used in prophecy, nor does he deny that great spiritual truths are set forth therein. His position is simply that the prophecies are to be normally interpreted, that is, according to the received laws of language, as any other utterances are interpreted, interpreted, that which is manifestly figurative being so regarded. He's saying basically the same thing as as D.L. Cooper. Now, when you break down study, we talk about, another way we talk about literal interpretation is that we use terms like grammatical, historical, uh, contextual study of Scripture. And what we mean, what do we mean by those terms? I mean, you've probably heard that a lot uh, over the years. We believe in literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of Scripture. Well, what does that mean? Well, grammatical means that we take the scriptures apart in terms of the grammar. The grammar means something. It communicates a level of meaning that is different from just the words that are in the sentence. And so you have to pay attention to the grammar, the grammatical structure, how the phrases and clauses are put together. So we have to look at the, the grammar, and then we also look at the meaning of the words. And the meaning of the words involves doing, doing word studies and how are the words used. How is a word such as, um, let me see, such as hagias used in the, in the New Testament? Well, hagias has a rich history. It's the word, it's translated holy, and you have this whole word group of hagias for holy and hagiazo to make holy, uh, hagiasmas, sanctification, uh, hagiazum, uh, all these different different words are used in this this whole context. Sometimes they're translated consecrate, set apart, holy. All these different words, and and it has a rich history in in Greek. So if you're trying to figure out the meaning of a of a Greek word used in the New Testament, do you go to a history of the Greek language going back to the fifth century B.C. And study your various how the word is used in uh, classical Greek and in the various idioms of, of Greek that's some you know four or five hundred years earlier than the time of Christ, or do you seek its its meaning in how it's that concept was used in the Old Testament? And you, you need to do both. But the primary reference when Peter talks about holiness or Paul's talking about holiness. Do you think they have in mind how, how Plato used the word holy or how Moses used the word holy? What do you think? Be how Moses used the word holy. You could figure out the, this, their frame of reference is not going to be uh, the, the Greek philosophy from the 5th century B.C. or how it was used in Greek drama uh, or anything like that. It's going to be how Moses used the word and how it's used and developed throughout the Old Testament. When Paul talks about holiness in the New Testament, he's going to have in his head Isaiah 6.3 when Isaiah falls on his face before God and, and the angels are singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That is going to be... Uh, the, the construct that's, that's in the back of his head and uh, not, not Greek. But you need to look at, at both. But you give more weight to the Old Testament. So you would look up, uh, I remember, I used to love doing this. You get into the Septuagint, 
which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And you look up all the uses of the Greek word hagias in the, in the Old Testament. And then you look at what, what were the Hebrew words that that Greek word group translated. And then that leads you to the Hebrew word uh, kadash and the various forms of kadash. And so then you have to do a word study through all that. So word studies are very involved, very technical, but you have to look at, at all of that to come out with the range of meaning for various uh, various words. So you connect the meaning of the words to the uh, parts of speech, the syntax, and how the whole uh, sentence is structured. And then you have to look at the historical framework. And many of you have heard the principle articulated many times that you ha- that the Bible must be interpreted in the time in which it was written. Now, I've actually heard that phrase ripped out of its context. And I've heard people try to say, well, see, if you interpret the Bible in the time in which it was written, they were mythological. And, you know, they believed it. People, they didn't believe in mental illness. They believed in demon possession. They just were, they were superstitious. So you have to interpret the Bible in light of the time in which it was written. Those people were superstitious and, and all of this. Well, that's not what we mean by by that phrase. What we mean is you have to understand the framework, the setting, the background, uh, the history of what was what was going on at that particular time and how that applies to the to the uh, to, to the passage. Then you have to look at it in terms of the context, not only the context in a passage and where, you know, you look at John three sixteen through 18, and it talks about believing in Christ. Twice you have the phrase, pistuo ace autan, believing in him. So how, then you have to look at how that phrase is used in the whole Gospel of John. That's looking at its context in terms of the, the, the literary context. But then you also have to look at what's going on in that passage when you have Nicodemus, come to Jesus at night, you have to understand what's going on with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he was a Pharisee, and, and the whole cultural context, and what the Jews were expecting in terms of the, uh, in terms of the Messiah. So you have to look at two different contexts, the, the, the literary context, and then the historical context. And uh, all of that is what comes together just to interpret Scripture. So we have various phrases that are used by different people to describe this. I pointed out last time it's called normal interpretation, uh, historical grammatical interpretation, a plain, uh, simple interpretation. Now, how do we know that this is the right way to interpret Scripture? Because if you look over the history of Christianity... There's a lot of different ways people have interpreted Scripture. They've interpreted literally. They've interpreted allegorically. They've interpreted mystically. They've interpreted in terms of uh, rationalism. Uh, there was a version of the Bible that Thomas Jefferson published, and he went through with his razor blade and cut out every reference to every miracle or anything supernatural. You know, just a good deistic version of the Bible. So you have rationalistic interpretation, all kinds of different meanings that people come up with and that's why you'd often hear people in, uh, at different times say, well, you know, you can prove anything from the King James Bible. You know, who cares if you're quoting the Bible? Well, you can make it mean anything you want to. Well, that's a pretty cynical view of interpretation, and it doesn't actually fly, but people who have weak minds gravitate to stuff like that. So you have to, um, you have to look at the text itself. How do we know... <coughs> <coughs> that we should interpret Scripture literally. And I pointed these three reasons out last time. First of all, because the prophecy that is fulfilled is fulfilled literally. The prophecy that is fulfilled is fulfilled literally. When Micah 5.2 says that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, he is born in Bethlehem. He's not born in Nazareth. He's not born in Jerusalem. He's not born up in Tiberias. He's born in Bethlehem. When it says that he will come from the line of David, Jesus comes from the line of David. He didn't come from uh, a Levitical line or some other line. So the the prophecy that we see that is fulfilled is fulfilled uh, literally. Second thing I pointed out was in terms of language and the image of God, that if we just understand the nature of God as the creator, totally distinct from his creation, then... Uh, God endowed man with an ability that could understand and comprehend what God was revealing. And that was the thrust of this particular uh, 
quote from Gordon Clark, that if God created man in his own rational image and endowed him with the power of speech, then a purpose of language, in fact, the chief purpose of language, would naturally be the revelation of truth from or communication of truth from God to man and the prayers of man to God. So if we just start with Genesis, we realize it's embedded in the first three chapters of Genesis is a whole philosophy of language that tells us how we should understand these things, that when God said, don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how was that interpreted by Adam? Well, he wasn't avoiding other trees, okay? He understands it literally. There was the one tree that was the issue. They didn't think it was some other tree, or they didn't think that it was, uh, oh, I've heard people tell me that, that the, the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, was uh, sexual procreation, all these other things. They, didn't, they weren't interpreting it that way. They were interpreting it in a literal, normal, normal fashion. And then the uh, third reason I pointed out was that any other sort of hermeneutical system ultimately leads to some kind of subjectivity and uncertainty as to what the real meaning is. And that's where you get into all this theological discussion. And that's why today the battlefield always goes back to hermeneutics. If you go to Dallas Seminary and you get involved or listen to any of the debates that have been going on for the last 15 years over progressive dispensationalism, it always boils down to hermeneutics. And in fact, the, guy, the men who uh, developed this whole new twist on progressive dispensationalism developed their whole, an, a totally new system of hermeneutics called complementary hermeneutics. And it's not literal. It, it, it's, it's got a whole different twist to it. But they had to do that in order to substantiate and argue for their, uh, their position. By the way, I don't think that ultimately if you push progressive dispensationalism to its ultimate, uh, you, it's, it's not dispensational at all. It's neither progressive or dispensational. In fact, Bruce Waltke, who was a great Old Testament professor at Dallas Seminary for many years, but was sort of a theological chameleon, it seemed like Dr. Waltke would... You know, some men are great in the language, but they, they're, they just aren't good theologically. And wherever, whatever school he went to after he left Dallas, he sort of conformed to their theological framework and he eventually ended up amillennial in covenant theology and teaches at, I think, Reform Seminary in, in Florida. But he, um, when he first read prog- about progressive dispensation, he says, this isn't dispensationalism at all. They, they've be, they, they've vir- they're virtually amillennial. So he, he saw right through this, whereas many, uh, many dispensationalists don't. But as I, what I'm pointing out here is that the... the this whole issue of how you interpret Scripture is, is fundamental to understanding so many things, but especially dispensationalism and millennialism. I have a quote here from Floyd Hamilton, who is a uh, critic of uh, dispensationalism. He's an amillennialist, and, but he makes a, a frank admission. He says, now we must frankly admit that a literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies gives us just such a picture of an earthly reign of the Messiah as the premillennialist pictures. Hello? See, that's what I'm saying. Is they, they, when it comes to prophecy, they shift from a literal interpretation to a non-literal interpretation. He, says, he goes on to say, that was the kind of messianic kingdom that the Jews of the time of Christ were looking for on the basis of a literal kingdom interpretation of the Old Testament promises. Another non-dispensationalist and very vocal critic of dispensationalism is amillennialist Vern Poitras. And Poitras says, says, I claim that there is a sound, solid, grammatical, historical ground for interpreting eschatological fulfillments of prophecy. What that means is prophecy that's unfulfilled. He's saying, what he's going to say here is, I contend that there's a way to interpret unfulfilled prophecy that's not the same as fulfilled prophecy. Remember the point I made a little while ago that that we we look at the precedent of the Old Testament, and Old Testament prophecies fulfilled literally. What we know is fulfilled literally, so therefore what is not yet fulfilled must also be fulfilled literally. That's only logical and consistent. But he said, no, it doesn't have to be that way at all. Uh, We we can (coughs) interpret eschatological fulfillments of prophecy on a different basis 
than pre-eschatological fulfillments. It's therefore a move away from grammatical historical interpretation to insist that, say, the house of Israel and the house of Judah in Jeremiah 31, 31. See, we're getting ready to get into this whole quote dealing with the new covenant in Hebrews 8. He says it's, it, it's a move away from grammatical historical interpretation to insist that, say, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, Jeremiah 31 and 31, must with a dogmatic cer- certainty be interpreted in the most prosaic biological sense, a sense that an Israelite might be likely to apply as a rule of thumb in short-term prediction. In other words, what he's saying is just because it meant house, literal, ethnic, genetic, house of Israel and house of Judah in Jeremiah doesn't mean that since it hasn't been fulfilled yet that it can't mean something different today, like the church. Okay, now here's another good quote from Oswald T. Alice. He was a Reformed theologian, early 20th century, and he writes, One of the most marked features of premillennialism in all its forms is the emphasis which it places on the literal interpretation of Scripture. It is the insistent claims of its advocates that only when interpreted literally is the Bible interpreted truly. And they denounce as spiritualizers or allegorizers those who do not interpret the Bible with the same degree of literalness as they do. None have made this charge more pointedly than the dispensationalists. See, I don't make this stuff up. That's why I give you these quotes. He goes on to say, The Old Testament prophecies, if literally interpreted, cannot be regarded as having been yet fulfilled or as being capable of fulfillment in the present age. Duh. See what he's saying? If you, if you interpret these prophecies literally, then the pre mills are right. You've got to have a future second coming and a literal millennium of a thousand years. It's going to have, have a primarily Jewish emphasis. So this is their basic position. Now, in covenant theology, they have an inconsistent literal hermeneutic. And that's why I pointed out that the real issue is how consistent you are in interpreting Scripture. For example, let me give you a passage here. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb shall graze to get together. Now, how do you understand that? Is that a literal wolf or a literal lamb? Or are we talking about an unbeliever and a believer? Just wanted to see if you are paying attention. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Well, taken literally, we understand that to be talking about the fact that during the millennial kingdom, there will be at least enough of a rollback of the curse to where there's not uh, antagonism in the animal kingdom. But covenant the- theologians will allegorize this and they'll say, well, this is an example of when the wolf Saul became converted. You know, the Apostle Paul, when Saul of Tarsus became converted and he became a lamb. Now, I, I just see those eyebrows knit up and people go, how'd they get that out of there? See, you, you just have to be locked away in a small room and for a long time without food or nourishment and you'll come up with all kinds of things. So that's just one example that it's talking about believers and unbelievers. Or Isaiah 65, 11, But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who fills cups, and who fill cups with mixed wine for destiny. Now this is in the midst of a context of judgment being announced on Israel because they have forsaken God and they've gone into idolatry. But... Uh, so it would look to us that when it says you forsake my holy mountain, uh, literal interpretation would see holy mountain to mean what? Those of you who've been to Israel, what's the holy mountain? It's the it's the Temple Mount. It's the forsaking the Temple Mount would be what? Not worshiping Yahweh, God of Israel, at the Temple, forsaking it and going after other gods. So that's how you would interpret this, that they have forsaken the Lord, they've forgotten the true worship as defined in, in, uh, in Exodus and in the Mosaic Law, and they have basically cast themselves adrift on the sea of, of chance. So that's how, they would, uh, uh, that's how a literalist would understand stand this. But, see, they would, uh, covenant theologians interpret my holy mountain as being a reference to the church. 
This is talking about unbelievers who have forsaken the church. Okay, here's another one. Isaiah 65, 18, But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. Now, this means that uh, literal interpretation that God has a plan for Israel, a plan for the Jews, a plan for Jerusalem, and that there will be a future time of rejoicing. But uh, covenant theologians will interpret this, that Jerusalem really refers to the New Testament church, for I create uh, the church for rejoicing and her people for gladness. And so it is interpreted to be a reference to the New Testament church. See, with, with <clears throat> allegory, you can do whatever you want to and make anything mean whatever you want it to mean. It's sort of like making it a living constitution, right? We've all heard people like Al Gore and others talk about the U.S. Constitution as a living document. Well, see, that's what happens. It's, it's, we have a rich heritage of this. It's not just popping up out of, out of nowhere when you have uh, liberals today interpret the Constitution in this kind of manner. Uh, they didn't begin with them. It, begin, it has a rich history going back to before the time of Christ. So we have to understand a little bit about where all of this comes from. So I want to go through a little bit on the history of interpretation. Now, as I pointed out earlier, over the history of, of Christianity, people have used all kinds of different ways to, uh, to uh, interpret the Bible, from just a woodenly literal interpretation that tries to make every word uh, significant in some sense, to an allegorical interpretation where everything's symbolic, uh, where it appeals to tradition that however the church fathers interpreted, that's what it means. Uh, rationalistic, where you get rid of all the supernatural. Subjective, what does it mean to me if you've been to a Southern Baptist or a Methodist Sunday school class, then you know what that's all about. Or um, mystical, where you just have to contemplate your navel for a while and think about it and not eat and, or whatever. And eventually it'll come to you. Now, as I pointed out earlier, we need to look at how the Bible interprets itself and let the Bible, let God reveal to us how to interpret what He says. And so when we get into the Scripture, and I'm not going to go through a lot of these, I'll just give you some examples because you're familiar with most of them. When God revealed the dimensions and the instructions on how to build the ark to Noah, Noah did not take those numbers and think that there was some hidden spiritual meaning that uh, he needed to ascertain in order to, fit, to unlock the code so he would know how to survive the flood. He took all the numbers, all the instructions, the kind of wood to use, everything, uh, literally. When Moses was given all the instructions as to what kind of fabric to use, what kind of wood to use, uh, how to uh, all the dimensions for the tabernacle, everything that was involved in that, he didn't allegorize, spiritualize. He didn't try to find hidden codes. Remember the book that came out about um, ten years or more ago now on in, the, the Bible Code book, cracking the Bible Code. Well, everybody's always trying to come up with some hidden, hidden meanings that are far beyond the literal uh, meanings of Scripture. When we think about Joshua invading. The, the promised land, and God giving him instructions as to marching around Jericho. March around Jericho in silence one time each day until the last day, and then the last day march around seven times, and when you finish, blow the trumpets and shout. He didn't march around three days or five days. He didn't try to find some spiritualized meaning to those numbers and then go into the Ark of the Covenant and cast his dice to figure out what it meant. He took it all literally. So we have a lot of examples. One that I think is from the Old Testament that I've gone to before is the prophecy in 1 Kings chapter 13 when the unnamed prophet comes to Jeroboam the first and destroys the altar and uh, <clears throat> says that one day in the future there will be a, priest, a king named Josiah who will destroy this altar and kill all the priests. And that's fulfilled some 200, 300 years later in 2 Kings Chapter 23, literally. So we have all this, all of this precedent in the scriptures where the Bible shows us how to interpret the Bible. God doesn't leave us, leave us cast adrift on this sea of subjectivity to uh, just kind of figure out what it all means. Another biblical example 
that gets us into the area of, of interpretation is when the Jews came back from the Babylonian captivity. When they returned in the uh, late part of the uh, early part of the of the fifth century BC, around 460 to 440, when uh, they're rebuilding the walls under Nehemiah. In Nehemiah 8, we have Ezra reading the law to the people. It's interesting, we read the law, everybody stood up. All day long, they read the law. We have trouble getting people to sit in a comfortable chair for 45 minutes to listen to Bible class. And when he read the scripture to them, they had the Levites were scattered throughout the crowd, and the Levites are then explaining and interpreting the, uh, the, what he is reading to the people because they haven't heard the law in a long time, and Ezra's probably reading it in Hebrew, but many of them could no longer speak Hebrew. They had grown up in Babylon, and they were probably fluent in Aramaic and maybe just had a smattering of Hebrew, so the Levites were helping them uh, translate and understand uh, understand the text, and it was done literally, and we had know that example from what I pointed out in the previous previous examples. By the time of Christ, though, see, coming out of that return to Babylon, you had this, this uh, hyper-religiosity developed because it was such a traumatic thing for the Jews to have lost the temple and to be kicked out of the land that they went to the other extreme in terms of uh, being rigidly developing these rigid systems of obedience. And that's where the, the Pharisaical party developed. And, but they developed this hyper-literalism where every little thing had some kind of meaning. And that led to a form of allegory. And by the period before Christ, you also had the Jews develop a system of allegorical interpretation. Now, it's interesting where this happens. It happens in Alexandria in northern Egypt. Now, that's really important because you have a a group of Jews that are living in Alexandria. It's in northern Egypt. It's Greek-influenced culture at that time. That's that's before Cleopatra, but her her ancestors, the Ptolemies, were uh, ruling. They were Greek. They weren't Egyptian, and they were ruling in in uh, Egypt. And so there's this tremendous influence of Greek philosophy and Greek thought. And if you go back in Greek thought, you have the great stories of Homer, the uh, uh, Iliad, the Odyssey, all these great stories, and they were understood originally in a more literal fashion. But as they talk about the gods and the goddesses and the gods are running around uh, seeking vengeance on people and they have this bloodlust and sex lust and everything else, that by the time you get to the 5th century uh, B.C. with the philosophers, they're a little embarrassed by these gods that are cavorting around like a bunch of out-of-control humans in, in, in heaven. So they, they wanted to, you know, this just didn't fit the model of higher philosophical thought of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. And so they began to develop an allegorical interpretation in order to make these things mean something else so that they could uh, deal in a little more comfortable fashion with the anthropomorphic antics of the, uh, of the Greek gods. And so they develop an allegorical interpretation. And later on, this enabled Greek philosophers such as the Stoics and the Epicureans to twist and change the writings of Plato and Aristotle to fit their philosophy. So they could go back and say, see, what they really meant was, and they would reinterpret using allegory to reinterpret earlier philosophers to try to make them say what what they were saying. Well, the Jews in Alexandria picked up on that. And... Uh, this is evidence in the Septuagint, the way the Septuagint tries to translate several uh, passages related to anthropomorphisms and anthropopathisms of God in the Old Testament. And you have two influential people in this period before the New Testament time, Aristobulus and Philo. Now, Philo lives from about 20 B.C. to 54 A.D., so he's roughly contemporary with, with uh, the life of Christ on the earth. And you also have the, the Essenes, the Jews that are living in the Qumran community, and they have this whole allegorical interpretation. And this is, comes out of, where did I say? You're going to have to remember this next time because I can't finish this tonight. Alexandria, northern Egypt. Well, guess where allegorical interpretation gets systematized when you get into the New Testament period? I mean, the post-New Testament period, the early church age. It's Alexandria with Origen and... Um, 
uh, his predecessor Clement of Alexandria, and they systematize this allegorical interpretation. And so uh, Origen comes along and says, well, you have three levels of meaning in the text, like you have uh, man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. You have the literal meaning, and then you have a moral meaning that, that relates to the soul, and then you have a spiritual meaning. But in allegorical interpretation, the allegorical or spiritual teaching of the passage doesn't have to have anything to do with the literal historical meaning of the, of the text. So it's just like you're looking for these hidden meanings. And uh, there have been uh, people who have come out, I'm thinking of a couple of pastors who came out of uh, some doctrinal churches uh, who were teaching a view that you didn't need to believe in confession of sin, that you really didn't need to confess your sin to be back in fellowship. Why? Well, if you read between the lines... In 1 John 1, 9, you'll see it. What's that? That's nothing more than trying to go back to some kind of allegorical, spiritualized, hidden meaning like, uh, like origin. And yet that was what dominates the church for the next, um, 14, next thousand years or more from origins about <clears throat> 250. Jerome and Augustine come in and they basically institutionalize allegorical interpretation. And so out of that comes a hostility to the Jews because they're no longer important. So all this ties together. Well, I'll cover that a little briefly next time before we get into some other uh, important things. But that gives you a little background. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that it's so clear, precise. We thank you that you have given us a way to understand it, especially in this church age with God the Holy Spirit who is our guide director and one who helps us to understand the scriptures and that you have given us examples within your word as how we are to interpret it and that we know that we can understand it accurately and precisely. Now, Father, we pray that we would uh, be strengthened and encouraged by our, the truthfulness of your word and that it needs to be the center of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.